This is the third part of the package for navigation for glider and TNG pilots. In this part, we're going to be talking about navigating in a TMG. Unlike in a glider, in a TMG, we can fly particular headings and speeds. In a glider, of course, we have to stop and circle, so that makes navigation rather different. Uh, but in a TMG, and on the TMG course, we need to understand the basics of what is called dead reckoning. And we'll be practicing that on the course. Although normally, we navigate in the same way as most people do these days in a powered aeroplane, using moving map GPS-based navigation systems as our primary means of navigation, and backing that up with map reading, and if needed, dead reckoning skills. There are some things that we need to understand to be able to do that. Uh, the first is something called the 1 in 60 rule. And what that says is that for small angles, one unit off track uh, for every 60 units along is one degree. So 10 units off is 10 degrees. So like, a bit like this. If we've got 60 units along the track and 10 units off, that's 10 degrees. So uh, by using this proportion, we can estimate angles quite well. And that means that if we're flying at 60 knots and have 10 knots of crosswind, that gives us 10, knots, uh, 10 degrees of drift. So we're flying along at 60 knots, 10 knots of crosswind, and that will give us 10 degrees. More generally, we can do this sum. The maximum drift of an aeroplane is the wind speed times 60 divided by our true airspeed degrees. And in a TMG, we're cruising along at pretty close to 60 knots. So our maximum drift then is uh, the wind speed. So we're not going to be drifting at more than whatever that wind speed is. So 10 knot, 10 knot wind speed, um, we're going to get maximum of 10 knots of uh, 10, 10 degrees of drift. And then the second thing that is worth understanding is the clock code. And that helps us uh, make a mental estimate of how much the wind is affecting um, our track, how much drift we have. Um, so depending on the angle uh, of the wind compared with our heading, uh, we can estimate the amount of cross wind drift we've got. We do that by using this clock code. So imagine a clock which has uh, minutes, 60, 15, 30, and 45, and fractions of the hour. So the whole hour, a quarter of the hour, half the hour, and three quarters of the hour. And if the angle between our heading and the wind um, is say 15 degrees then we come here to 15 degrees and we use a quarter of the drift if the angle is 30 degrees we use half the drift if the angle is 45 degrees we use three quarters of the drift and 60 degrees or more uh, we use all the drift For a head or a tailwind, to make that calculation, we do the same thing, but we use 90 minus the crosswind offset. So if we, uh, for example, had been using 30 degrees of drift in, for our crosswind, um, for the headwind, we'd use 60 degrees, and we'd use the whole of the wind speed as a headwind or a crosswind. We can plot our route on a half million map or even a quarter million map. Um, we do that using um, pens, but draw circles around the waypoints you're going to use. That way that you can, you can see uh, what's in there when you, when you get there. And then a reasonably bold line in between. Then we can estimate headings and times and mark up the map. Um, if we want to be able to fly from the map, we can do so like this. We're going to use, uh, put these, these numbers on the map in a way that we can easily get to uh, with some nav boxes. So here we've got true track, magnetic heading, the distance in nautical miles, and the time we expect it to take. We put some 10 degree lines on um, in order to be able to estimate our track error as we're flying. And we can either use a protractor 
or we can use the 1 in 60 rule uh, to plot that. And then we mark some fixes along the, um, the tracks of things that we're going to use to estimate what our track error is and how far along we've got. So in this case, on our way out from Gransden, um, I've used Little Staughton. Uh, on the next leg, we've used the A1M, which will, which will give us a good time check. And then on the third leg, we can use Witten. Um, so those are three things that we can use to estimate the errors that we've got. Um, a fix such as uh, an, an airfield is going to give us an accurate fix, both in terms of our angle and our uh, distance along the, along the track. But it may be a little difficult to see if we're somewhat off track. Something like a road that goes like this, the A1 that goes across our track, it's not going to be very helpful in terms of telling uh, what the track error is, but it will tell us quite accurately uh, how far we've got. So different fixes do different things. And I've also put a wind arrow on the uh, chart here with the wind uh, forecast at the uh, level that we're going to be flying. Making the calculations for uh, our headings and times though, uh, we can either do that using the uh, clock code that I mentioned earlier and doing mental arithmetic or uh, some simple sums on a calculator, or more conveniently, if we use a tool like SkyDemon, uh, which we can show here, I've put the, uh, the route in to uh, SkyDemon, and we can get out a uh, plug, a pilot log, with all the information we need to make the flight. And what we've got here is uh, it's given us the minimum safety altitude we might want to fly if the visibility is particularly bad. Uh, and we can set the criteria uh, that generate that uh, elsewhere in the, uh, in the program. Uh, we've got a level that we've chosen, in this case, 3,000 feet AMSL, uh, a speed. It's worked out the true track for us. Uh, it's taken the wind from the forecast and given us a magnetic heading to fly. It gives us a ground speed for the leg, the distance, and then the time. Conveniently, it's also provided us with frequencies that um, we might use. And if we're going, we can print that out and uh, take it with us. Uh, but also if we have that on a, on a tablet, uh, we, we can get that information in the air. What it doesn't do is, far, is provide a very convenient way of capturing the times that we get to the various legs, which as you'll see, is an important part of dead reckoning. So you can use some space here to record the time at which you start a leg um, and when you reach the end and also any updates of the estimate of the um, estimates that you're going to going to have for arriving at a waypoint or a new heading to fly so that you can capture those as you go now the key to dead reckoning is accurate flying both heading and speed um, so you need to manage your workload very carefully Lookout and aircraft and engine management are important, uh, but you need to keep your scan going um, so that you stay on an accurate heading and you stay at the right altitude. If you don't do that and your heading wanders all over the place, um, you won't really have any clue as to why you're off track and therefore your corrections won't work. Don't try and inch along the map figuring out where you are at all times. After you've crossed a waypoint, make sure you're going in the right direction, as we'll discuss in a moment. And then um, wait for the fix to come up, which will come up roughly when you expect it to, um, and you can identify it, find it, and, and see what your error is. And then you can make an assessment of what, you, what you're going to do. So if you've got a track error, you can adjust your heading. Um, that's then a new baseline, and any changes are from that. If it's a time error, you'll need to correct your anticipated arrival time. Uh, be careful you don't misidentify a fix. That will really confuse you. Um, so pick fixes and waypoints uh, that are easily identifiable and you, so that you won't be confused. So here's an example. Um, in this case, if we're flying the leg um, from Ramsey to Rushton on our little Navex here. 
And as we cross the A1, just here, um, we expect that the leg should have taken um, two thirds. This is about this, this point is about two thirds of the way along times 12 minutes. So, so eight minutes. Act, in actual fact, it turns out that it takes us 10 minutes, say. Um, so we are uh, a couple of minutes over time. So we can then crack our estimate for Ramsey uh, being the 12 minutes that we thought the whole thing was going to take us times 10 over 8, so 15 minutes. Um, and that means that when we're looking to figure out where, whether the, the, the town in front of us is, is Ramsey, um, if it's coming up at 15 minutes, that's pretty much what we'd expect. Um, if it's at 12 minutes, three minutes early, we, we're thinking, well, OK, that, maybe that's not Ramsey, maybe that's something else. We need to have written down uh, the, the previous times, as I discussed on the last slide, uh, in order for this to work. You can't remember everything and you're going to be busy. As we're flying along, we can actually fix our position at the fixes. And on this leg, which was the one from Ramsey to back to Gransden, uh, we used Witten as um, as a fix. So let's suppose uh, that at Witten we're 10 degrees left of track. So we were expecting to go just over the um, right hand end of the of the Witten runway and let's suppose that um, in fact the, the runway is to the left and this is where our 10 degree uh, lines on the map come from so we can make an estimate of what that difference is. So we're 10 degrees to the left and we've got two thirds of the leg still to go. So here's the correction we make. Our track error is 10 degrees left of track and we've got two thirds of the leg left. And we make a correction um, equal to the track error divided by the proportion of the leg we've got left. So that's the track error divided by two thirds, uh, which is the track error times the inverse of that. So times three over two, the track error was 10, so that's 10 times 3 over 2, so that's 15 degrees to the right. Uh, the original magnetic heading was 199, so our new heading that should get us from here back to Gransden like that is now 214 degrees magnetic. Now, there are those of you listening to this who are going to go, yeah, I can do that, and there are other people who are going to throw up their hands in horror. So let's look at an easier way of doing that if you need to. So if you can't do that maths, just remember the smaller the distance left to fly, the bigger the correction needed. So here we go. We're going from here to here. And here's our 10 degree line. Let's see. Let's think what happens if we, in fact, are progressing up with a 10 degree track error like that. If we pick up the error quite early on, then we're going to need to turn more than the error. So if we turn, we've got a track error here of 10 degrees. If we just turn 10 degrees, we'll be going along parallel to where we should be. So we need to turn more than that. If on the other hand, we've left it right till here, again, if we turn 10 degrees, we'll be parallel to the track that we had intended. But the difference to get back to our uh, actual destination waypoint is quite a lot more. And here um, we can see I've given three examples that will help us with the maths. Now the, the simplest one is if we pick a fix that is halfway along the leg, so we've got half the, the leg left, then all we do is double the track error. So if, you're fi if you can pick fixes that are halfway along the leg, then double the track error, job done. If, on the other hand, those fixes aren't conveniently available, um, if the, it's, uh, we've got two thirds of the leg left, then you need to multiply the track error by one and a half. And if we've got a quarter of the leg left, then it's four times. So even if you just remember those three and pick the one that is closest, that's probably going to be good enough uh, for what we need to do here. So when we're flying along, let's have a think about our priorities. Well, the first one is the normal scan, lookout attitude instruments. 
um, an emphasis on lookout, making sure we're uh, the attitude is correct, we're pointing the right way, and keeping the instruments in our scan. We want to hold the heading, the attitude, and the speed. We're flying it visually, so if we're flying a heading, we're picking a point on the horizon um, and pointing the aircraft to that. And every time we come back through the instruments, we're going to have a look at the speed, we're going to have a look at the level, and um, we're going to be looking over the nose to check we're still pointed at the thing. And occasionally we'll look at the compass uh, or whatever uh, heading reference we've got uh, in order to check that that's right. And if, if the, we find we've got an error that persists over a few scans, we might then do something about it. But we're not chasing it every time we, we scan it. If we're flying a track because we're using a GPS as our, um, as our track reference, um, then we're still going to fly the heading visually, but we'll adjust based on that instrument. And if we've got a moving map, we can actually just align the actual track with the required track, which is quite useful. Every so often, every 10, 15 minutes, we want to do a free to check. Uh, might well be convenient to do that just before you come to a waypoint. Um, and remember that every time you pick up a map or an, a nav log, um, then have a good lookout first. So you, you don't want to be head down in the cockpit too long. Some tasks that you might do might take a little while. And what you don't want to happen is for um, the level or the heading of the aircraft to change too much as you do that. So split those tasks up into bits and go back to your scan in between. So if you're looking at something on the map, keep your thumb in a place where, where you can come back to it. So it's a sort of reference point. Um, do a little bit of looking, do a scan and a bit of lookout, come back to the map. You're going to change radio frequency, same thing. If it takes you more than a few seconds, um, do half of it, go back to a scan, come back half come back to half of it. And most of all, just enjoy the flying. It's good fun. Um, and you, you should enjoy it. What else are we going to be doing as we fly? Well, there are some second priority things besides those fairly high frequency things we've just talked about. As we uh, go through a waypoint, uh, here's quite a useful mnemonic for you. TTT. Turn onto the heading and check. Time, note the time or start the stopwatch if you're using a, a stopwatch. And if you need to, um, make a transmission. Don't try not to fly through the, the heading and keep going um, and then turn because you'll be off track already. Um, so get that turn done right on top of the waypoint. Once you're aligned with your new um, heading, do a gross error check. Um, it's making sure we're absolutely going in the right way. Is, is there a big navigation feature that you can see that's in the right place? Where's the sun? If you're meant to be going uh, south and it's in the afternoon, is the sun in, in your, on your ahead of you on the right somewhere where you'd expect it to be? Uh, look for fixes. Um, so look for the fix. You, you're expecting something so you can look for it on the ground. Once you've spotted it, carefully check it uh, Cross-check it with other features, make sure it's coming up at the right time or certainly within the bounds of reasonableness. Um, evaluate any track errors compared with the 10 degree fan line. Calculate the adjustment to the magnetic heading and make a note of it um, and um, take any time changes. Write the times using your watch over each fix as a clock or actual time uh, or put them on the plot. There are some differences according to what equipment um, you've got. If you're flying without a moving map, you're completely dependent on accurate flying and fixes. Um, so closely monitor the heading and track and timing and be very careful about your fix identification. Um, if you've got a, uh, a compass rather than a GPS track line, you can, you, you've got to fly a heading allowing for wind. You've got to make the estimates of track error. You've got to make the changes and so on. If you're using a GPS, it could be a simple GPS, uh, just giving you a, a track and a track to fix and a distance to a fix. And you need to combine that with a plug and a map because um, taking a go-to through a piece of airspace might be a, a, a problem. If you've got a, a moving map, then make sure you've got a backup to that 
uh, perhaps a, a, another moving map on your phone um, or certainly a, a, a paper map. Monitor the, the map to the ground, uh, but still fly visually. Point towards a feature, cross-reference the track and keep a very good lookout. Let's have a think about what you can do if you're navigating and you're airborne, uh, but the weather's getting bad. Well, the, the first obvious thing to think about is just turning around. If you're heading into um, a sudden weather deterioration, then turning around is often that best course of action. So if the cloud base is coming down, have a think about what the, uh, the threats are. And the obvious ones are obstacles and hills, uh, particularly if the cloud is on the hills. There are various methods of calculating a, a minimum safety altitude, but the easiest is, is to take the highest grid obstacle on the half million chart and add 500 feet. You can fly around less than that altitude, but only if you're VFR and so long as you know where the obstacles are. Um, and by VFR, I mean probably not just the legal definition of VFR, uh, but actually decent visibility that lets you see. So if you're flying underneath the MSA, you've got to be certain of your position. The other thing that you can do is divert. Uh, and if the weather is less than good, then, then as you fly, have options continually in mind. Um, diverting early is normally much easier and less of a drama than leaving it until you absolutely desperately have to. You can use GPS to get to wherever this diversion is, but if that's not available for some reason, uh, then draw a line from the current position to the diversion airfield, uh, possibly following some line features to make it easy to navigate. Uh, can, you can use the VOR rows on a map to help you uh, get the track and estimate the distance using your 10 nautical mile thumb. Once you've got that, adjust with the estimated drift to give you a heading to fly. You know what the maximum drift is going to be. That's the maximum adjustment to track to calculate the heading. And likewise, you can work out the ground speed to estimate the elapsed time from the distance. Probably worth trying this on the ground a few times before you have to do it whilst you're flying. If you're low because the weather has deteriorated, then there's a few things that are likely to happen to you. One is it can get quite turbulent um, if the wind, if you've got moderate winds, uh, and certainly in the lee of any hills or built-up areas, things with large trees and so on. Uh, so be prepared for that. And map reading can become a lot more difficult at low levels and in poor visibility. You can't see as many features as normal. Uh, they appear to appear in front of you quite quickly and pass by quickly. So hold the calculated heading and time and don't panic if you haven't seen a decent feature for a few minutes. Think about following a line feature. Um, you could, for example, build in a heading, an error to your heading track so that you hit a railway line and you know which in, in, in which direction to turn. Uh, you'll be looking at the map more often. Consider holding the map up um, so that you can see it and, and look out very easily. You need to think about um, vertical navigation as well, and, and particularly avoidance of CF CFIT or control flight into terrain. So again, ideally maintain the MSA or above that. And if it's impossible and visibility is poor, it might be best to do a precautionary landing, uh, especially if you've got a suitable airfield um, somewhere on the way. And think if you're flying around low, Think about ATZs and danger and restrictive and prohibitive areas um, that might get in your way. Uh, if you're up at two and a half, three thousand feet, generally you're out of the way of a lot of that, of a lot of that stuff. Uh, but lower, uh, you're going to be running, running through it, and that could be bad. Uh, think about noise sensitive areas when you're planning um, and flying. So it definitely should be part of your flight planning. Don't fly low over. Um, places that are going to worry about it. But if you're doing a diversion in, port weather, you're, in poor weather, you're unlikely to be as well prepared. So the priority is to land safely. And the TMG is pretty quiet, so don't become fixated on noise abatement. The key thing is to fly safely. But there are some rules. You mustn't fly over built up areas at a level so low that you can't glide clear in case of an engine failure. So fly around towns and cities. Um, Flying around towns and cities can be the, the, the safe course of action. But note the 1,000 foot rule, uh, which is over uh, built up areas, you need must be more than 1,000 feet. Um, and in general, the 500 foot rule that says 
that unless you're taking off and landing, you've got to be at least 500 feet from people, vehicles, vessels and structures. Um, which probably means more than 500 feet above the ground or any mast or anything sticking up from the ground. If you do get lost, um, there's some things you can do. You can try and establish your position. Uh, if you're low and you can climb, you'll get a better view, which is good. Uh, but try a rational approach to figuring out where you are. Look back at the last fix, the last time you knew exactly where you were, and estimate your position based on that. What direction have you been flying in? How fast? For how long? That gives you a point where you might be. Now, there's going to be a degree of uns uncertainty on that, so you could probably draw a circle around it depending on how long you've been going for, what, what the errors might be. So you could draw a circle and say, well, I'm probably in that circle. Now, if there's nothing in that circle that you can see um, to help you, then have a look outside the circle, uh, maybe in the direction you wanted to go, but maybe in a different direction of something that if you fly there, you will be able to recognize it. Major town, uh, major road or a town. If so, head to that. Um, you know you're in the circle, so go to that thing that is somewhere else that you will come across if you go in that direction, because you know it's in that direction. If you think you're in danger of infringing airspace, uh, then head away from it or land, or, or and uh, give London D&D a call on 121.5. Uh, tell them you are lost and they will help you get back to um, where you want to go. Uh, easiest if you're higher than two or three thousand feet, but I try them anyway, uh, even if they'll be able to give you advice uh, and maybe get, get help. They're a really good source of help. Most of all, go and enjoy yourself.